so um, as Mark said, the project itself is divided into four different themes. Um, I'm talking about the first of those themes on devices, semiconductor devices. Um, there'll be subsequent speakers on the other three themes following on from this. So I'm going to talk about the work that's been going on in the devices area. And as you can see, this is a, uh, a, a, a piece of work that involves four universities. This is the new Warwick uh, branding, by the way, if you've never seen that before. I don't know why we did that, but we've got rid of the old one and we've made it that. There's Bristol, Newcastle and Cambridge. Notice Cambridge don't keep changing their branding every five minutes. <laughs> but Warwick does. It's obviously important for them. Right, so I don't expect you to read all of this, but it's uh, what we said we do. It's what we said we do when we started. So we want to make a significant impact. Uh, to the state of the art in the semiconductor technology area and of course that's a wide area so we're not aiming to do to work in all the different areas so we've picked a number of key areas uh, in particular we've, we've, we're doing work on power IC technology in silicon we're doing work on uh, IGBT structures superjunction IGBT structures which I'll talk about in a bit in silicon as well and we're also working on wide band gap devices uh, silicon carbide and gallium nitride and their reliability so that's what we said we'd do and what I'll try and explain to you in the next uh, uh, 20 minutes or however long I've got is, uh, is what we actually have done so uh, within this particular piece of work there are four themes or work packages so the devices theme has four work packages the first one, I'll just go through them all, is on power device design and fabrication. So in this particular theme, we're looking at advanced super junction silicon devices, manufacture design of silicon carbide devices, and also producing compact models for those devices. The second theme, or second work package, work package two, is on interfaces and materials. So um, in any semiconductor device, there's lots of different interfaces between different materials, between silicon and silicon dioxide, between different semiconductors, different insulators. And this really is looking at those properties. In particular, we're looking at uh, improving the quality of MOS interfaces for silicon carbide devices, big issue. Uh, we're looking at methods to uh, characterise the interface and the final part of this work is looking at the growth of high quality thick epitaxial layers of silicon carbide. Thick being the operative word there for high voltage devices. So we're looking at layers bigger than 30 microns. Um, the third work package is on reliability. So this is really looking at some of the underpinning physics and trying to understand what are the key issues that cause these new materials to be uh, unreliable, especially uh, gallium nitride has a lot of prob problems with defects and how they change the device characteristics with time. So it's looking at building up a set of predictive um, models and also measurement techniques for characterising that degradation in the devices themselves. It's not about the packaging degradation, it's about the, what's going on inside the semiconductor. And finally, the, work, the last work package is on integrated circuits. So here we're looking at, uh, obviously, this is the biggest market segment in terms of where power semiconductors go into. It's enormous compared with the high voltage areas, but we're looking here at producing high voltage, and by high voltage here we mean 700 volts. High voltage uh, IGBTs and MOSFETs, that integrate into a CMOS process so that you can build converters almost on a chip. Um, so getting up to 700 volts is very challenging. And the challenging part is making the on-state 
re uh, resistance of these things as low as possible. So we're looking at techniques for improving the performance of these devices. So there's the four themes. That's how it's split up. Uh, and now I'm going to go through what's been going on at each of the universities. Um, I thought it was better to do it that way than to go through those four themes in detail. So we're going to look at what Cambridge have been doing first, uh, uh, etc. So Cambridge, they've been mainly working on the first of those work packages and the fourth. So looking at superjunction um, silicon IGBTs and integrated circuits. Uh, so the first one, the work package one on superjunction IB, IGBTs, are using, uh, these are quite advanced structures actually, um, they're very sophisticated. Cambridge don't actually manufacture these, they design them and get them manufactured elsewhere at a foundry, but they're devices that they've designed and tested and, produce, and, 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 and show some very uh, promising results. So they're looking at quite low voltage breakdown IGBTs here, 1.2 kV. Um, recently the results from this work have been published at ISPSD which was in Hong Kong a couple of months ago. So the work there pro progressing very nicely and here's the structure. Um, as you know, if you're familiar with uh, power IGBTs then you'll recognise this as, as, a, as a very advanced form of IB IGBT. It uses trenches a lot of devices are planar. These are mo most uh, devices are moving towards trenches. But the engineering about how you make this top surface as effective as possible is, is very detailed. Um, so this is a trench structure with, with uh, an M plus injector here. Um, so in this device, there's an oxide down the side of these trenches, which forms the, 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 the sort of MOS structure. You get a channel down the side of the, of the trench and then this injector, so electrons would flow from the top through those uh, inversion layers and enter this injection layer and then be injected down here. So this oxide uh, on the side of the trench here is, is what's actually doing the switching. This bottom part of the device is responsible for the voltage blocking capabilities of that structure. So... Um, What's often a problem is uh, how you uh, make this injection across the surface as uniform as possible. If it's only being injected from one point at the edge of the, of the, uh, at the end of the channel here, then that will cause the resistance to be higher than it need be. So by spreading it out using this injector gives you um, the, uh, a, a, a much lower on-state resistance, causes the injection to be from both sides, very high injection from the top and the bottom. So it gives you the lowest on resistance. Um, now, the superjunction part of it is enabled by these P-rings here at the bottom of the trenches. Normally these trenches would have a P implant at the bottom anyway, but these have been extended and made bigger so that you can see you've got a sort of superjunction structure here. You've got an N-type region here and then these P-rings partially uh, um, penetrating the depth of the drift region. And so these act as charge compensation um, parts of the structure. They make what's called a resurfed um, structure, reduced surface field as they'd be in a lateral device. Um, and that allows you to increase the doping in this drift region as well. So um, this, uh, this whole structure becomes a very effective and one of the most advanced forms of uh, IGBT, uh, um, certainly in the engineering of the top part of the surface that uh, you, can, um, you can get. This is an SEM or TEM picture of, uh, uh, of one of those structures, actually an SEM it says there. But um, you can see there that you've got double trenches here rather than a single trench there. P-rings at the bottom and there's the N plus injector there. And you can see that uh, the, uh, the, the, these feature sizes are, are, are submicron features. These trenches are very, very small indeed. 
And here's some of the results from those structures. Um, first of all, uh, in terms of the on-state resistance, BDS on, but the on-state voltage drop. You can see that different types of, uh, of technology here uh, are, are, are tested. FS means field stop. This is the enhanced field stop. And this is the field stop with the P ring. And you can see as you go up in generations of technology, uh, then you improve, you reduce the on-state voltage drop. You're down here to two and a half volts. Um, and it's fairly temperature insensitive as well. If you look at the switching performance of these devices, on the left there, you can see that, uh, again, there's a, there's a comparison between the, the fields, this generation of devices and the one with the P-ring. You can see that you get, uh, the closer to this corner you get, the, the, the better the performance of the device. You can see that there's a, a dramatic increase in the uh, switching performance uh, of, of about 20% which is uh, very significant for these type of devices. So that piece of work has been going on and it's producing real devices now and uh, they are being looked at, are being exploited commercially. Uh, so work package four that uh, Cambridge are also working on is on um, the 700 volt, 700, 100, 1 kV bulk uh, silicon lateral IGBTs and MOSFETs. Um, they've been again fabricated as a foundry externally and uh, characterised. Just said that. Uh, the bare dyes um, have been tested at different temperatures and different uh, uh, switching speeds. They've been, all the measurements are pulse tested some devices have started to have some reliability measurements done on them and, those tr and, and similar to that previous uh, slide, the trade-off between the uh, uh, V-on and the turn-off uh, energy are being compared. Uh, right. So here's the chip, one of the chip layouts of this particular batch, MPW. I don't know what MPW stands for. <coughs> They've, got the, they've pointed out these resistors. They're really to identify where you are on the wafer. These resistors have all got different values. And by probing those, you know where you are on the chip. So they're nothing to do with the power devices themselves. It's just to locate them. And you've got two sets of devices here, MOSFETs at the top and various sized IGBTs at the bottom here. And you can see there... Uh, they're lateral because of this cellular structure. So all the contacts are on the top of the wafer. The current enters and leaves on the top and the gate structure is on the top as well. There's the characteristics of the MOSFETs. And there's the breakdown characteristics. Achieving greater than 1,000 volts, which was the designed... Uh, uh, value. And that's a photograph of some of the lateral IGBTs. And some measured characteristics of the IGBTs as well. Again, the, these were going up to, oops, these were exceeding the 700 volt design capability. So uh, Cambridge are currently exploiting that technology as well. So move on to Warwick next. I'm not quite sure. This isn't in alphabetical order. Um, I have to say thank you to a, a number of people who are working on this particular theme, especially Vishal and uh, David Martin who are here. Uh, these two are PhD students who aren't here, I don't think. Certainly Yegi isn't. Uh, but uh, Vish Vishal is our man who looks after the epitaxial growth system and uh, uh, David is um, our uh, device processing expert. <coughs> we had the unfortunate situation that we did have another RA on this project, but he left at Christmas to go and work for Infineon in Germany, as happens. 
So, here's some of the work that's been going on in this work package. Obviously, we want to grow thick epitaxial layers. Um, typically, to uh, get to uh, 3,000 volts, you need uh, 30 microns here, and to get to 10,000 volts, you need approximately 10 mi uh, 100 microns of, uh, of epitaxy there. And the problem is, when you grow those very thick layers, it's very, um, uh, you don't just grow it on the, on the wafer itself. Here's a wafer. You grow it all over the equipment, the chamber, <coughs> that's being used to grow it in. So it's very expensive because you have to clean out the chamber very frequently when you grow these thick layers. And it's also difficult to grow them quickly, and it's difficult to grow them with good quality. So what we've been focusing on is trying to grow these layers thick, uh, thick layers quickly and we can grow 100 microns in about an hour, an hour or two which is very uh, fast indeed <coughs> and the quality is, is, is excellent. We've bought a, uh, an epi reactor for this uh, a special piece of equipment was bought through linkage with this project and it's the only one in the UK so this uh, well, for selling carbon, it's the only one in, in the UK that uh, can be used to grow this material. So, uh, this is a picture of one of the wafers that we've grown. This had 3 kV, so 30 micron layer on it. You can see it's transparent, which is different to silicon. And this is an AFM picture of the surface, so in the surface roughness it is quite acceptable. Uh, and the quality of the wafer, it's very difficult to compare qualities of wafer. So we tried to compare it with other um, suppliers. Now, really, shouldn't have put the name of the supplier on here, but we have. And you can see that the purple one is, is our measurement of the wafer we grew, the, the epi layer we grew, and the uh, blue one is from another company. <coughs> and basically, the narrower this peak is, the better the quality of the material is. So we think we're doing a good job compared with commercial uh, suppliers out there. Um, and, as, and it's very difficult to get commercial suppliers who give you 100 microns of epi as well. This was probably one of the only ones you can read, easily go to and get those thick uh, epi layers. We've also done some mercury probe measurements on those wafers to look at the, uh, the, the, the sort of um, variation of the thickness uh, across the, uh, of the wafer and, and the doping. And here you can see that we've compared again uh, our, our wafers with, uh, with the company we bought the, uh, the material from. And it's pretty good. There's, there's our one in the middle there. The doping could be a bit lower, but uh, it's quite acceptable for a first uh, one or two runs. The thickness of the wafer is uh, pretty much identical to what uh, the suppliers of the equipment can grow as well. So we, we found that the thickness is less than 2% across the wafer, which is what you can buy commercially. And uh, we also found that there were small amounts of contaminants but they were pretty much below the detectable limits uh, and so uh, uh, it, we demonstrated that the, the growth process was very high purity. So at that point we've now got a system where we know we can grow high quality epitaxial layers. And some of the physical characterization that we've done on those layers is shown here uh, using transmission electron microscopy. What you have to do is with TEM is to cut out very thin films or, or through the structure that you want to look at so that you can pass uh, um, uh, electron beams through it and look at the cross section. Um, so we've developed a novel technique for making very thin uh, 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 sections um, using uh, standard lithography to start with. It improves the, the speed at which you can do that dramatically. There's some pictures of some of the uh, uh, looking through some of the epi layers that we've grown and of course we've got uh, AFM 
to look at the surface profile as well. <coughs> That's quite challenging. We've also um, been making structures using some of the epi layers that we've, we've grown to try and evaluate the quality of those epi layers in real devices. Uh, so we've made some pin diodes. We made this type of structure. Uh, there's one there. Um, so they're uh, a MESA structure with uh, all the doping here. This, this, all these different layers are grown using epitaxy. These bits here around the edges are implanted. Uh, when we did quite a bit of uh, trial and error here, the first few samples that we had had this sort of bumpy IV characteristic, but uh, we found out that this passivation here wasn't quite good enough around the edge. And if you improve the passivation, you end up with very nice quality characteristics like that. Um, we've also done some work on uh, uh, some lateral MOSFETs on these structures, on, on the EPIs that we've grown. And you can see that we've got some mobilities which are, are, are about 20. Typically, um, this, this, this is using uh, some post-oxidation anneal process. Typically, when you grow these, ep these oxide layers on silicon carbide, without doing some post-processing, um, you, uh, you, uh, you get mobilities of down here. So this is like four, four or five times better. We've actually improved this quite considerably now. We've got up to 40 now, so it's on a different scale. Uh, we've also um, been doing quite a bit on, on, on characterization of implants. Uh, so these are simulated implant profiles, uh, and, and we've also um, taken those uh, through this simulation program uh, and, and compared it with uh, uh, SIMS measurements on the actual devices and found them to be pretty much identical. Okay, so I'll move on now to the work that's been going on at Newcastle University. Again, it's a team of people. Uh, I don't know if anybody's here from, there's people here from Newcastle University. Definitely. Is, uh, I'm not, I don't think Nick's here. Pretty busy man, because he's a pro vice chancellor. Uh, and Anthony O'Neill, and then uh, two research fellows there. I don't know if they're here. Should be. Maybe they're late. So, what have they been doing? Again, they've been looking at trying to uh, improve this uh, oxide interface. But in, t in, the, in, uh, in the previous example that I showed you, it was actually thermally grown oxide. Here, what they're trying to do is to use different materials for the gate oxide. So it's not MOS, it's metal insulator uh, semiconductor. Uh, and they've been trying to use uh, alumina, uh, in, uh, on top of a very thin layer of silicon dioxide. So you have a, an extremely thin, just a few nanometers of normal silicon dioxide. And on top of that, you put an, a, 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 an ALD deposited um, dielectric. And the literature seems to point at, this is taken from the literature, that uh, you get extremely high mobilities. Remember, we had about 20. Uh, the peak mobility here is over 300. We've not seen that yet, but uh, that's what is promised using this technique. So we're supplying uh, 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 some epi layers to, uh, to, to, to <coughs> Newcastle, and they're building these structures on top. They have some unique uh, processing capabilities to deposit this material. It's not to scale that. Uh, another piece of work that they've been looking at is trying to implement some uh, uh, superjunction structures in uh, silicon carbide. Obviously, you get the same benefits if you can implement uh, superjunction structures in, in silicon carbide as you would in silicon. Uh, and so uh, people have started to look at this, and this is one of the first practical 
demonstrations of that. I mean, what you're trying to do is, uh, this, this is the way a, a normal superjunction device is, is built up with making n, p, n, p, n, p col uh, pillars. Uh, this is difficult to do in silicon carbide because the way they do this in, uh, in, in, in silicon is with either lots of implantations to build up the p, color, p pillars or th they etch out a hole here and regrow epitaxy inside. Neither of those is really suitable for silicon carbide. So we're trying to um, look at what happens if we can build this structure using epitaxy. Uh, and there's some initial simulation results. Uh, shows that you can get pretty much close or exceed the uh, one-dimensional um, limit of silicon carbide uh, by using these superjunction structures. Uh, and, and here's some more. Um, so th that piece of work has just started to, to make some devices. They've not actually got any results on that yet, but they will have in the next few months. Um, this shows uh, some work that they have been doing some measurements on, which is trying to look at this interface. So there's the uh, silicon dioxide, looking at this interface between silicon dioxide and silicon carbide and looking at the defects or the material that's here. You always get some sort of graded layer there, which is neither silicon dioxide or silicon carbide, but a mixture of the two. And they've been probing that interface to look at, uh, at uh, what's there. Because obviously we don't want that there. And so if we can remove it, brilliant. Uh, this shows some more uh, simulations of the uh, superjunction devices. Um, and how important it is to get the doping in the P, P columns and the uh, N columns as, uh, as close to each other as physically possible. Otherwise, the blocking voltage falls off very quickly. This is where it's balanced at the big, in, the, in the middle. So the charge in both those pillars is the same. If it falls one way, you can see that the um, blocking voltage falls off very quickly. And if you get it the other way, it falls off very, very quickly. Um, and that's the part of the challenge in making these devices. OK, so this is the final university of Bristol. Um, so they've been working on reliability and probing um, some of the uh, gallium nitride devices. Uh, this is a general slide. Just shows you where we are with these different materials. I think most people have probably seen that, but if you haven't, then you can see that uh, silicon superjunction de devices are here. That's the uh, um, one-dimensional limit. Superjunction devices exceed that. So the further you get over here, the better. Uh, this is the uh, silicon carbide limit and gallium nitride may be even better still, although that's not been reached yet. Uh, so in terms of reliability, this is a typical bathtub curve. You get early failures, which always happen, and you try and filter those out when you're manufacturing and you never let them get out of the factory. Then the device will wear out with time. So it's these wear out mechanisms in the device that Bristol have been looking at. And eventually those wear out mechanisms lead to the devices failing. Um, and of course, um, you'd like this to be as far over in time as possible. But it's understanding those mechanisms and how they accelerate, which is important. So this shows a picture of a gallium nitride hemp. Uh, you, 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 there's the structure. It's um, as a, an SEM from looking at it from the top. You can see that uh, you've got the source drain contacts there. And these are the gate fingers here. The gates are very, very thin. They're very thin stripes that go between the source and the drain. And of course, you apply voltage here, and it allows a current to flow from source to drain. Um, and uh, that's an AFM image looking at along this edge. Now, what they found is that with time, as you stress this device, then the leakage current through the gate increases 
it increases exponentially. And that's due to defects forming. And you can see these little red dots here. They are pointing out defects on these gate fingers uh, as they grow with time. And this is a zoom in of that. You can see these little pits that occur along the, along the fingers. And they multiply with time. They get more of them. And they emit light, so they're quite easy to see. They emit blue light. Uh, and this shows a picture of, uh, oh, oh, there's that curve, the gate leakage again, increasing with time. And here's the electroluminescence, the light that comes out of, of, of that gate structure. And you can see it pretty much mirrors that. So you can just look at the light that comes out around the gate finger and try and uh, uh, gives you a good indication of how well you've made the structure. If there's no light, then you've made a, an effective structure. This, show, this, this is a count of the uh, number of defects, those little red blobs um, increasing with time as well. You can see they all increase. They're all linked to each other. These defects are being produced, and they're producing light, and they're as well producing gate leakage current. Um, uh, so the, the, what happens is these defects uh, get to a certain size and then they saturate. They don't get any bigger, but you get uh, more and more of them developing along the gate interface with time. Uh, so the distance between these pits uh, gets, uh, gets closer as time goes by. And various mechanisms for that have been identified and these have been published. In, in the literature, um, they tend to occur right here at the corner of the gate. Um, uh, 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 and um, so there's the edge of the gate there. You can see these things grow, and they tend to grow out in fingers along, along away from the gate. And eventually, the 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 um, the leakage and the light occurs at the end end of these fingers as they grow, with time. Uh, and, and that's been published recently. So, I think that's probably the last slide, uh, and it covers some of the work, or all of the work, that's been going on in the devices theme over the last uh, uh, year or so.